Linda Cardellini is with me now in Studio Q. Hello. Hello. You look great. Thank you. Wow. Thank wow. you. I'm, people have to tune in and see it on TV because they can't see it on radio. But you look very elegant. Um, you know, the Bloodline's a hard show to talk about in the sense uh, because there are just so many twists and turns right. in, in the first season. And, and we don't want to obviously give all those away. But let's start with you describing the dynamic that exists in this family, in the Rayburn family. Uh, it's a fa- it's it's v- well the dynamic in the family is interesting. I, I the thing that I liked about it when I when they pitched the show to me was the idea that these four adult siblings um, explore their roles within the in the family and their relationship within with each other and then with our parents. And I think you know the black sheep comes home. I'm the peacekeeper kind of sister, and there's our responsible older brother who's the sheriff, played by Kyle Chandler. And then we have a hot-headed brother. There's all these sort of types that you see in a lot of different families. But exploring those roles that you were given in childhood and what that means when you become an adult and uh, and where you, your place in the family stands in terms of going out into the real world, who you become then inside your family and outside of your family. And how is that a comfortable role for you in terms of playing the peacemaker and the peacekeeper? I like it. I think that, you know, the show's very layered. And so what you think is is going on, there's always about 10 other things also simultaneously going on with just about any character. And for me, I, I love the idea that she is the only, you know, she's the only the only girl with three older brothers and and you know in the show and and her place within them is to, she really hopes for the best she has this optimistic way about her and that of course will be challenged mm. and so for me to start one place and and you have that sort of turn on its head in some ways. Yeah, is, you're, is you're the bridge builder in the, in this family. And she, yeah, she tries to be. She does. And she holds out hope that when her oldest brother comes back, that things are going to be okay. And maybe this time things will be different. And that is uh, yeah, <laughs> part I mean, of her problem. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of, I think with most families in, in real life and also on screen, that there's a lot of old grudges, old stories that people hold against each other in this family. What is it about... Um, family that's so important to these characters? I think they've been raised in a family where the motto is family comes first. And that idea is challenged when family challenges each other, you know? And I think that's what happens when Ben Mendelsohn's character comes back, Danny, and he plays it so beautifully. Um, He's sort of this tortured person who's been a scapegoat for a lot of the family's problems. Another thing I find fun about the family dynamic is that I'm the youngest. So my experience as the youngest is very different from my eldest brother's. His childhood is different than mine. And, you know, when a lot of things happened in childhood that they recall, I was much younger than everybody else. So I think that's something I am the youngest child. And I think that's something that my sister's, she's 13 years older than I am. And we had very different childhoods as as the first child and the fourth child, you know. So I think that's an interesting thing as well. And so as you explore this on screen, you're exploring your own family. I mean, it would be hard not to sort of reflect back on that and think about that. Are there lessons um, that you're learning as you go through this? Or you were going through this about your own family? Oh, I don't know if there are necessarily lessons. I, 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 it's always, you know, you always want, you're always afraid to to think of like the lessons you're taking from (laughs) from something that's so dark. But I think, you know, I, I think at the heart, the story is about people who don't necessarily know how to contend with the truth. And uh, and I think that's something that decays the family. And I think, you know, it, it calls to mind just trying to be more honest in, in, in your interactions with people. Because I think, like Meg, she doesn't realize she's being dishonest sometimes because she's trying so hard to please everybody. And she's not pleasing herself, nor does she really know what her own truth is. And she, she not only pleas, uh, uh, not pleasing herself, she's really pleasing no one by trying right. to, to, to please. Which is uh, a hard lesson for people pleasers to understand, people, you know? Yeah, yeah. So is there anything about um, that idea of trying to please everybody and the consequences sort of not pleasing yourself and really not pleasing anyone else, that your this idea of choices that applies to your life as an actress? Um, I, you know, I think that being an actress or being an actor, or it's about choices. I think, you know, there are many different ways to play a single scene and, and what differentiates one actor from another is their choice of how to play it. So I think, you know, I think her choices are are managed by sources outside of herself. And I think, you know, as, as, a, as an actress and in a business, I think you have to try to always be sure you're listening to 
yourself mm-hmm. and 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 that can be that can be difficult and challenging at times when there are pressures of a business aspect put on, you know, commodifying an art. So I think that, you know, there I, I can relate in that sort of way, I mm. think. And as you say, I mean, there's just, it's pressure, right? You're, you, there are expectations or others have expectations of you as an actress. Maybe pleasing isn't the right word, but pleasing the audience, the director, the cast. How, do you, how does Linda Cardellini go about that, dealing with all of that? I think you can't think about it too much. You know, you sort of have to just try to try to let everything else quiet down and listen to the voice inside your head. And the thing that I try to, you know, or the voice inside of you somewhere, or wherever it's in your head, and sometimes there's multiple voices in your head. And that's not a good thing. But, <laughs> um, but sometimes I can Depends use my job to saying, exercise yeah. those voices. Uh, I think I think f- for me, you know, reading a story and if, and if I really relate to the story and the character, then and I feel I have something to bring to it, then that's where the there is no other choice. I, I feel like I have to do it. Mm. And sometimes I get the opportunity to do so, and sometimes I don't. Um, when we talk about seeing families portrayed on TV and film, some circles um, would believe that characters need to be likable mm-hmm. in order for an audience to, to care about them. Do you do you care about that? Do you care if, if the character you're playing is quote-unquote likable? Well, sometimes I like to play with people who are unlikable. I think that's pretty fun, and mm. that happens in life. I think they're all different kinds of people. I think more than being likable, you want people to believe whatever it is that you're doing. And uh, I feel like even with the worst characters, and I think a lot of television shows now have the anti-hero, and that would be considered unlikable, but because you can, because you find a sort of honesty about the performance or the storytelling, you can relate to it. And I think that is more important than, than mm-hmm. trying to consider whether or not you're likable. You're playing, um, you know, you're part of this larger cast that, that, that's centered on a family and bloodline. You did similar, I guess, just by the outside aesthetic in, in Freaks and Geek. Um, and I, I, I want to sort of delve into to, to your family, if, if, if you'd let me. You, you said that you had a fairly intense relationship with your own family um, and that it took a long time and to cut the strings. Oh, yeah, yeah. I did say that. It's true. It's true. You know, I'm very close to my family. I love them very, very much. I have a very wonderful, supportive family. And, uh, and it, it, you know, when you're very close and have a, we have a big family. Um, How big? Well, I'm the one, I'm the baby of four, but my mom's of seven and, and I have an Irish Italian background. So those are <laughs> people who multiply. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, it, it's funny because whenever we try to have a family party, it, it, it never ends up being under 50 people, even if it's the smallest of parties. So I remember growing up in our, in our family and we would have everybody to our house and we would have sometimes over 200 people for Thanksgiving. Wow. Yeah. So, and my mother was my mother's the very my parents were very generous people and they always made sure that if there were anybody who didn't have a place to go that they had a seat at our house and so I remember one year there was a woman who my aunt worked at a supermarket and there was a woman who um was a homeless woman there and she was always outside the supermarket and my aunt became friends with her and she was at our house but she was a germaphobe and so she had uh, plastic bags over her hands and she was wearing a plastic bag and my mother said, you know, go over and – I can't remember her name now. It was many, many years ago when I was a kid. And she's like, go over and say hi. You know, it's Thanksgiving. Go over and talk to so-and-so. And as a kid, you know, it looked so different to me. Hmm. But that was normal. There was always somebody there who uh, had no place to go, and they were always welcome at our house. So I grew up with a lot of different <laughs> things happening. And, and so given the sense of, of a big family – um, and your nuclear family, I suppose, um, uh, more pr- appropriate to the question I'm about to ask you, which is about this idea that you said it took a long time to cut the strings. Why did it take so long for you? Well, I think when you're very close to your family, I think, you know, it, it's it's hard to separate, hmm. you know. And I moved away at 18 to study theater in Los Angeles and, and become an actress, and that was difficult. I remember I was crying in the bathroom uh, in my dorm room my, my freshman year, and I was in Los Angeles, which is only an hour flight from San Francisco, which is where I was raised. And and I heard another girl crying, and she was in the bathroom as well. And, and I said, you know, what's, I, she said, what's wrong with you? I said, I miss home. I said, it's so stupid. Because I've, I live, you know, I, I live in, my parents are in San Francisco. It's only an hour away. And she said, she was crying. And she said, I miss home too. And she said, and I said, well, where are you from? And she said, Costa Mesa, which was only 20 minutes away. <laughs> so, I, you know, I think, and she had come, she came from a big family too. We became very close friends. But I, I just think that, you know, there's something about 
you identify with your family so much being from a big family and it's your whole world and it's your whole community. It's your clan. Yeah. So you you start uh, appearing in movies and TV shows a few years after you go to school when you're when you're 21 and you join Freaks and Geeks um, in 99 with um, Jason Segal, uh, James Franco, Seth Rogen. I mean, I'm a big fan of this show, as so many people are, and um, many critics have called Freaks and Geeks one of the most realistic depictions of high school life. And it's been said that the cast members were invited to bring their own personal experiences and their own mm-hmm. personal humiliations, especially as teenagers, um, in, into the scripts. What, what kind of stories did you bring in? Oh, my God. I don't even remember at this point. <laughs> I don't remember, but I remember a lot of the stories were Paul's, Paul Feig's, you know, and I... <laughs> He had some of the most terribly embarrassing stories. I'm trying to think. I don't remember at the moment. I'd have to go through and look at all the episodes. Um, do you do you remember though, like as a younger person at, at 21, sort of what you were trying to add to that family dynamic in Freaks and Geeks? I what I thought was important when I had been reading a lot of different scripts at the time for these disgruntled teenagers, and I thought the thing that separated Lindsay from those things is that she truly loves her parents. And much like I'm talking about not being able to cut the apron strings, I think that was a very difficult decision for her too, is how do you rebel and still love your parents? Like how do you go through the hateful teenage years without totally hating your parents? Mm. I think she was smart enough to know that her parents loved her more than anything and they were trying to do the best thing for her, but at the same time couldn't quite do those things. And so for me, that was key to playing her was, was keeping in mind that as angry of a teenager as she wants to be. She's very sensitive to her parents' feelings. Hmm. And the, the cast of that show um, was has been described, and, you, and you've said as much, as sort of your second family outside this big Cardellini clan, um, that all of you who worked together felt like a family. Yeah, yeah. Well, we were all fairly green, you know? Some of us had worked some, and some of us had worked none, but none of us had done too, too much. And uh, to be there together... Plus being with a group of hilarious people, always bonds you, laughing always bonds people together. And we laughed so much. So we were, you know, young and new and we were in this show that was different than anything that was sort of going on. We, I remember going to one of the NBC um, events that they had and we didn't know anybody. We all sat in the corner and we <laughs> looked like literally like the freaks and geeks of the entire network, which we were because we were later canceled and kicked off. So we were like the losers. <laughs> but, but I remember thinking it just... It, we bonded together by being sort of outcasts. Mm. In, in, and what in role those did ways. you play within that that clan of outcasts? Were you the peacemaker amongst them all? Oh God, Were I don't know. Sister? It's hard to sort of gauge who mm. you. I, I I always find it hard to look back and say what your role was within something because you're so present at the time. You know, I don't know. I don't know exactly where my role was. I, you know, I've. I had a lot of, I don't know. Mm. Can tell you. Okay, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, so you're, not to compare the two shows too much, but you're part of families in both the show, and then it, at least with Freaks and Geeks, and you, you can tell me what's happening in, in Bloodline in terms of you guys all kind of building up this family if there is one. But with Freaks and Geeks, you're young, you guys are ambitious, you're getting, not your first taste, but I mean, it's it's big for all of you. And you build up this this um, unofficial family, let's, let's call it that. And then the show was canceled, Quite mm-hmm. quickly, unfortunate, but but that's that's what happened. Um, what was that like? Because when you become, yeah, it was devastating, and we knew um, going towards the end of it that it was not going our way. You know, there was indicate there were indications all along the way, and um, Judd and Paul decided to shoot the last episode before. We got canceled because they felt it coming. So the the last episode that we shot was not the last episode that you see in the series. We shot that like three episodes before that, I think, in order to have the show end in a very certain way, which I thought was so it's so smart of them. Um, but so we felt it coming. We hoped it wasn't going to be true, but we felt it coming. And then, and then uh, we were devastated. We were mm-hmm. terribly sad. We felt like it was really something special. And back then, there was not there was no Netflix. So if a show died, it sort of just went into some library somewhere probably and you never saw it again and never saw the light of day. So with things now like Netflix, people are finding a show that was on, you know, a decade ago mm-hmm. and seeing it with 
new fresh eyes, especially because, you know, some of the guys have gone on to do so many wonderful things that people are drawn to the show. And, and so, well, I, you know, Seth Rogen, James Franco have gone on to work on a lot of um, Judd Apatow movies, which have almost... Uh, I don't know, they've kind of become a genre unto itself. You have um, had so many varied roles it, it, since Freaks and Geeks, dramatic roles throughout your career on ER, on Mad Men, play, playing different facets of, of a woman. Um, it, could you see yourself returning to comedy? Yeah, I just did. I, do, I'm, I have a movie coming out um, in May with Kristen Wiig. It's a dark comedy called Welcome to Me. And then I just finished shooting, in New Orleans, I just finished shooting with uh, Will Ferrell and Mark Wahlberg, a comedy called Daddy's Home. So I like, <laughs> you know, to me, the greatest joy about being an actor is to be able to do something that's different from one thing to the next, you know, and I, to play sort of many varied roles. And I've been really fortunate with that kind of stuff. And so what, looking ahead, what, what, what would you like to do that you haven't done? Oh, I just, I don't know. Maybe... I don't know. Maybe I'd do something classical. I haven't done anything like that in a while. Hmm. Since I was in college, probably doing theater. It's been nice to talk to you. Thank you very much, Linda. So nice to talk to you, too. Appreciate it.